as U.S. Chinese tensions continue to grow, I think it's becoming abundantly clear that the United States is incapable of competing with a rising China head to head. And by that, I mean, we see how China deals with the rest of the world. It deals with the rest of the world by trading, by doing business, by building massive infrastructure projects that benefit both China and their partners all around the globe. The United States is incapable of doing this. So how are they attempting to contain China? How are they attempting to prevent China from surpassing the United States? They're doing it through political interference, political coercion, subversion, and even violence, including terrorism. And I want to talk about some of that terrorism here in Southeast Asia, along China's periphery, an area long targeted by the United States in a bid to encircle and contain China. And uh, one of these incidents happened more recently. I'm going to talk about that one first. The second incident, which happened in Vietnam, uh, several attacks on Vietnamese police stations, was actually uh, in the comment section of one of my videos. Somebody asked about this, so I looked into it, and I was quite shocked and disgusted with what I found in the Western media, which did indeed cover this incident. The first incident I want to talk about, however, is this in Myanmar, which is right next to Thailand, where I am based. I've talked at length about U.S. efforts over decades to install a uh, client regime into power headed by Aung San Suu Kyi. They built a massive network of so-called non-governmental organizations to help her into power and to help her consolidate power. Uh, the military in Myanmar ousted Aung San Suu Kyi and her government, and uh, ever since then, the U.S., the U.K., other nations in Europe have been backing the opposition, and they are trying to get them back into power. And they are doing this through an extreme violence, terrorism. Uh, some might call it a civil war or an insurrection. It is terrorism. And this is one of the, the examples of the terrorism taking place. So it says, Lily Nang Kia, killing of Myanmar singer on nerves pro-military celebrities. So she is a singer and she was killed by the US backed terrorists. And yet, if you go through this entire article from top to bottom, you will not see the word terrorism or murder or anything used even once. As a matter of fact, the entire article is attempting to justify her murder by claiming she was close to the military. She supported the military, and we've said that the military is bad, so that justifies murdering a singer who is who's not part of the military, who's only expressing her political views, which are different from the uh, agitators and terrorists that we back. So it was okay to kill her. I mean, this is what the BBC article is essentially saying. Now, if we go to the BBC article and read from it, it says, Myanmar singer Lily Nang Kya died in Yagun Hospital uh, a week after being shot in the head, allegedly by gunmen opposed to the military she championed. Her death was not only, uh, her death has not only shocked military supporters, but also celebrities working with the pro-military media. The 58-year-old was close to top junta leaders who seized power in 2021, plunging the country into war. She has also been accused of being an informant. Two men have been arrested and accused of her killing. Now, they're murdering her for her political views, and they're murdering people to help advance their political agenda. This is the textbook definition of terrorism. This is the definition of terrorism under international law, yet the BBC never talks about this. The BBC doesn't, throughout the entire article, cite any human rights organizations like Human Rights Watch or Amnesty International, who you would think would condemn this because this is outright terrorism. This is murdering a, a civilian solely because of their political beliefs. Political beliefs that the West doesn't like, but political beliefs none the less. These people who murdered her were not doing it in any sense of self-defense. It also says uh, that these two suspects belong to an urban guerrilla group opposed to the military. So these are the so-called freedom fighters that the West has been talking about. 
uh, for several years now, claiming that they are fighting for democracy against the evil military junta in Myanmar. But as you can see, they are actually just terrorists who will murder anybody, uh, not just the people who they are trying to oust from power, but anyone who supports them. They also murder anyone who doesn't sufficiently support them enough. So they, they could be people on their side, but they don't support them enough, so they murder them as well. This is what's been going on, and I've been covering this for years now. And I will put older videos about these atrocities as reported by the Western media in the video description below. The BBC continues, Ms. Kyo's killing is the latest in a series of assassinations of high-profile pro government supporters. Not people in the government, people who support the government. They're killing these people. Uh, they're killing people for free speech. Four days before she was attacked, a well-known nationalist and pro-military supporter, Tint Nguyen, was fatally shot in the head while at a tea shop in Yagon, uh, the city's main city. He had been in hiding after surviving a shooting last summer. So again, this is outright terrorism. The opposition that the U.S. is backing, the opposition the U.S. wants back into power, is carrying out systematic terrorism across the entire country. Then the BBC goes on and talks about how the opposition celebrated this singer's death on Facebook of all places. It says, a famous songwriter, Ang Nyang San, who is a pro-democracy supporter, had been embroiled in a long-standing social media row with Miss Kyo. Uh, he was arrested last week after liking a photo of her lying in her car after being shot in the head, mind you. BBC doesn't uh, remind readers of that. Death is sad, he posted on Facebook. But because there is personal hurt and hatred, I clicked satisfied isn't that nice so the bbc calls him a pro-democracy supporter and the bbc repeatedly throughout this article refers to the opposition as pro-democracy yet they're murdering people for their free speech they're celebrating the death of their political opponents solely because they have different political views is that consistent in reality with democracy the obvious answer is absolutely not uh, so there's two things I want to point out here. First of all, obviously that goes completely against Facebook's terms of service and all of their policies about abuse and promoting and cheering on and glorifying violence. And yet this is the norm in Myanmar, uh, the opposition on in Myanmar on Facebook. They have free reign. They are allowed to say anything they want. They can threaten people. They can celebrate death. And their, their accounts will always be safe. And anyone who supports the government in Myanmar, they will be banned. Uh, this is from 2021. Facebook's ban of Myanmar's military will be a test of the true power of social media platforms. And so what you see here is Facebook playing a prominent role in controlling the flow of information inside Myanmar. Myanmar, like many nations in Southeast Asia, has utterly failed to protect their information space. It is dominated by US-based social media platforms, which openly work with the US State Department to advance US foreign policy objectives. Facebook in Myanmar is deleting anyone who is pro-military, and they are allowing the opposition to get away with anything that they want, including cheering on terrorism, threatening terrorism and cheering on terrorism, even though it's obviously overtly against Facebook's stated terms of service and policies on uh, the use of violence or the promotion of violence on their platform. The other thing that I want to point out is this use of the word pro-democracy. It's very clear that the BBC and others across the Western media use the term pro-democracy simply to describe anyone the West is supporting that is helping the West advance their foreign policy objectives, and anyone who is obstructing them, they are anti-democracy, has absolutely nothing to actually do with democracy, human rights, or freedom. We can clearly see the opposition in Myanmar uh, is not upholding any of these so-called values the West claims it stands for, very clearly. They, they stand for the exact opposite. So that's Myanmar. This utterly disgusted me and this isn't the first time i've seen the bbc doing this the bbc does this here in thailand regarding political violence they will cheer it on they will justify it they will spin it or they won't even cover it when the western-backed opposition is carrying out violence when say the thai police react to this violence they will 
act as if the Thai police out of nowhere for no reason is reacting violently to what they will try to depict as peaceful protesters. They've done this many times, even back in 2010, when the US-backed opposition brought war weapons into the streets, uh, rifles and grenade launchers, and the BBC attempted to the, depict it as the Thai military cracking down on mostly unarmed protesters, which is an admission that at least some of them were armed and they were heavily armed. Now, I wanna get into the next example of terrorism. All of this took place just this month, June, June, 2023. This is in Vietnam. This is Radio Free Asia. This is funded by the U.S. government. It is a U.S. government-funded media platform. We're talking about June 11th, 2023. Armed group attacks Vietnamese police stations, plural. 39 people arrested. And then right under the headline, it says, Reasons behind attack in Central Highlands unclear but people in region have felt oppressed and cheated. So I guess it's okay to carry out a terrorist attack. By the way, uh, some of the nine people who were killed were just innocent civilians, uh, bystanders uh, caught, caught up in these attacks. There were also uh, public officials who were killed. So it says the uh, state-linked Voice of Vietnam website said Tuesday that police had now arrested 39 people and raised the death toll to nine people, four police officers, two commune officials, and three locals. So again, another clear example of terrorism carried out by some uh, extremists among an ethnic minority in Vietnam. Throughout the entire Radio Free Asia, you will not see the word terrorism used once. As a matter of fact, the, this entire article, like the BBC article, spends most of its time trying to justify and spin the terrorism. Now it says, the reasons behind the attack weren't immediately clear, but anger and frustration in the region has grown after decades of government surveillance, land disputes, and economic hardship. It also says that in 2020, Human Rights Watch said the Montanards, uh, so that, that is this ethnic minority involved in this terrorist attack, have been subject to constant surveillance and other forms of intimidation, public criticism, arbitrary arrest, and mistreatment in security force custody. In detention, the authorities question them about their religious and political activities and uh, any efforts to flee Vietnam the group said during the Vietnam War, the Montagnards fought alongside the U.S. Army Special Forces in the Central Highlands. So maybe that's why Viet Vietnam's government is suspicious of them. They fought side by side with American invaders during the Vietnam War. And from that point onward, having lost the war, they have pursued separatism ever since. And it never says that once in the Radio Free Asia article, but I've done some digging on this ethnic minority, the extremists among them, and they are indeed pursuing separatism in Vietnam. That is why the Vietnamese government is suspicious of them. And of course, they aren't just pursuing separatism politically, they're also doing it through armed terrorism. Now, I want to go back to the year 2000 just to show you how long this has been going on and how the United States government from the end of the Vietnam War up until today continues to support this ethnic minority and their bid for separatism in Vietnam. So here is a U.S. government website, .gov, govinfo.gov, and this is a 2000, a year 2000, United States Vietnam trade relations hearing. And there's all of these people that are involved, uh, different representatives uh, within the US government, but there's also Montillard ethnic minority representatives. And they are from an organization called Montillard Human Rights Organization. So again, it's always the United States funding these fake NGOs claiming to uh, be upholding or fighting for human rights, but in the fine print, you will always find the cause of separatism uh, on the official website itself, just like with the Uyghurs in China's western region of Xinjiang. They claim that they're fighting for human rights against uh, Ch a Chinese crackdown on them, but yet on their own websites, they admit that they're separatists. So of course the government's going to crack down on them, just as the US government would crack down on separatists within US territory. So if we look at what was said during this hearing, there's a question asked about how the US can 
most effectively influence the pace and direction of economic and political reforms in Vietnam. So uh, this is a U.S. government hearing, and they're asking, what is the best way we can interfere and meddle in Vietnam economically and politically? And here was the answer. It says the number one goal should not be to help them, Vietnam, grow economically. Because as Ronald Reagan said about the Soviet Union, uh, every week he would say, what we have to do is undermine the Soviet Union's economy, which eventually led to freedom in Russia. And what do they mean by freedom in Russia? That was at the collapse of the Soviet Union. Remember, this hearing was in the year 2000. Uh, Russia was still trying to recover from the collapse of the Soviet Union and build itself back up. And it was still being preyed upon by the United States, by the United Kingdom, by the rest of Europe at that time. It also says, we must do instead, what we must do instead is what Ronald Reagan did, support those people in Vietnam and in that region who seek democracy and support communications with the people of Vietnam themselves who are for a more free and open democratic society. We have lots of avenues open to us. Uh, we should have major efforts through the National Endowment for Democracy and bolstering Radio Free Asia and so forth. That is the way to bring a better, more peaceful and freer Vietnam. Of course, uh, they have been undertaking these efforts. This human rights organization, by the way, admits on their own website that they work with the National Endowment for Democracy, that they receive money from the US government. And of course, Radio Free Asia, their role in all of this just this month regarding terrorist attacks carried out by Montillard terrorists, separatists and terrorists, their goal is to whitewash the terrorism and make it out as if these US proxies are actually victims rather than just terrorists and yet again, a vector for US interference in Vietnam's internal political affairs in violation of international law and more specifically the UN Charter. Now there is a testimony given by one of these Montillard representatives actually of the Montillard Human Rights Organization. They gave testimony in this 2000 hearing and this is what they said. The United States government is the only hope to get our Montillard people out of Vietnam and help our Montillard people who remain in the Central Highlands to have the rights to live and have the opportunity to develop their lives. And of course, by that, they mean to not be part of Vietnam, to just carve off territory from Vietnam and have their own, uh, their own independent autonomous region so that they can be part of the process of breaking up breaking up, dividing, and destroying Vietnam. So we have US representatives admitting they want to interfere in Vietnam. They would like to see it collapse and be overthrown like the Soviet Union was. And then you have uh, representatives from US funded human rights organizations claiming that they essentially, they seek separatism in Vietnam and they are working with the United States government to do so. So that was in the year 2000. This is the uh, MHRO website today. And of course, uh, under accomplishments, er everything is about them in Washington, D.C., working with the U.S. government. And then there's a, a, a part here, if you just uh, National Endowment, you will see National Endowment for Democracy mentioned by name. And what, what, in what context? They had an event, a small group meeting with selected Montillard participants and the Montillard Human Rights Organization. This uh, this is their website, United Montyard Overseas, and guest speakers will share information, seek your ideas, and encourage discussion about the topics of Montyard self-determination, self-governance, and models of autonomy around the world. MHRO will share information about its research and the development of the legal document, the Montyard Fr Framework for Freedom and its efforts with the National Endowment for Democracy and U.S. Institute of Peace and other U.S. government uh, our organization. So there you have it. So that was back in 2000 from, from the Vietnam War. They were fighting alongside U.S. invaders to the 2000 where they were openly working with the U.S. toward regime change in Vietnam, regime change in separatism up to today where you see on their website they're still working with the U.S. They are funded by the U.S. and militant Montillards in Vietnam are carrying out terrorist attacks in pursuit of separatism. 
And then uh, going back to Radio Free Asia's article, now that you can see that uh, the US government is behind this group from Vietnam War all the way up to present day, funding them, helping them, working with them, encouraging them, now you can understand why Radio Free Asia isn't going to call it terrorism, while the, why they're going to try to justify this terrorism and spin it as if it's somehow justified. And again, I just want to point out to you, in the title alone, armed group attacks Vietnamese police stations, 39 people arrested. This is terrorism. And yet, right on under the headline, it says reasons behind attack in Central Highlands unclear, but people in region have felt oppressed and cheated. This is an attempt by US government funded media to justify terrorism. That is what that is. And that is what the entire article is. That is what the BBC did reporting this singer's murder by terrorists in Myanmar. They attempt to spin justify Terrorism. That's what they're doing. That's what the BBC does. That's what Radio Free Asia does. That's what the Western media does. So we see two examples, just two of many, of Western state media organizations reporting terrorism, but not calling it terrorism, and in fact, working very hard to convince readers that this terrorism is somehow justified. The US does this all across the globe. Everywhere they go, they were doing this to China itself. They have been doing this to Russia itself. The Shanghai Cooperation Organization has openly talked about stopping U.S. interference uh, among member states. Uh, they openly refer to these, this type of interference as attempted color revolutions, and they've talked about working together to prevent foreign forces from instigating these color revolutions. Uh, that is something that has come out of the Shanghai Cooperation Organization. Now, Southeast Asia is organized into ASEAN, the Association of Southeast Asian Nations, ASEAN. And they have fundamental principles, which first and foremost include non-interference in each other's internal political affairs. And yet, collectively, ASEAN is being impacted by foreign interference from the collective West. Why doesn't ASEAN organize together a collective response to this interference, which is affecting each and every single member of ASEAN, from Vietnam to Myanmar and everywhere in between, including Thailand, where I'm based? Their information space should be cleared out of these US-based social media platforms that monopolize their information space. They should create their own individual social media platforms that they can control within their information space and they should work together collectively to encourage the security of ASEAN information space and protecting it against foreign interference, including from the West. They should also work to cut off the, the flow of money from the United States government, the British government, the European Union, all of that money flowing into Southeast Asia, into each and every one of these countries, backing these opposition groups, some of them separatists, some of them even terrorist organizations, they need to cut that money off and they need to support each other in their efforts cutting that money off. Because if, say, Thailand today said we're going to cut all of the NED money flowing into Thailand, the U.S., the collective West, the media across the West would target Thailand. The rest of ASEAN should support Thailand. And when, when it's someone else's turn in ASEAN to cut off the funding, Thailand should help along with the rest of ASEAN to support that country in its bid to secure its own sovereignty. The individual sovereignty of every country in ASEAN is going to add up to the sovereignty, the overall sovereignty of ASEAN itself. They're being collectively attacked. They need to work collectively to defend themselves. As China continues to rise as the U.S. as a global hegemon continues to fade. Washington's temptation to resort to backing opposition groups up to and including terrorism, uh, that's only going to increase. And what they're attempting to do here in the region is to either affect regime change in each and every one of these countries or sufficiently destabilize them to deny them as a viable partner for China and the rest of Asia's rise. Only time will tell whether Southeast Asia, which is being collectively targeted by the West with this type of interference, again, up to and including terrorism, whether they're going to collectively work together to fight back 
or not. We, only time will tell. We're just going to have to wait. And in the meantime, I will continue uh, covering these incidents that are going to be spun and, and attempts made to justify them in the Western media. I will peel away the propaganda and show people what is really going on. If you thought this video was useful, please like and share. Think about subscribing. It's free to do. It helps the channel grow. Check the video description below for other places you can find and follow my work. In the video description, there are also all of the links that I referenced in this video, as well as uh, some others that I didn't cover, but which give added context to these topics. There are also ways in the video description below where you can help support my work. I do not monetize my YouTube channel. If an ad pops up, feel free to skip it. It's not helping me out at all. If you do want to support my work, please do so through Buy Me A Coffee and also Patreon. Again, the links are in the video description below. And for everyone who has been helping out, whether it's month to month or one-time donations, or even if you're just sharing my work with others, that all greatly helps. That is what makes this work possible. So thank you. And as always, thank you for watching.